now we're going to move on to our next speaker. So I'm really delighted to introduce Ben Lambert, who is a researcher at Oxford University. Uh, he has a brilliant book, A Student's Guide to Bayesian Statistics, which I know has quite some following, along with his YouTube channel. So, uh, Ben, can I hand over to you? Sure. Thanks very much for the uh, very nice introduction and for the invitation to speak today, uh, Eleanor. Um, so um, I'm just going to try. Uh, I know we sort of did this before the call. I just want to double check that that this sort of my screen sharing is working OK. Um, are you seeing my full screen and is it kind of changing when I press the button? I can see your screen at the moment is not changing slide. It's uh, not full screen, but it's not in full screen mode. Ah, uh, okay. That's, I should have tried this earlier. I might have to just present on the small screen, which is fine. Um, okay, let's try this. So Perfect. I'll go out of this. Uh, hold on. Let me just try this. Um, hold on. Is that changing yes, slide? It is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry, it's not not entirely optimal, but there we go. Anyway. So um, yeah, thanks again for the invitation to speak today. Um, I thought it's it's really good that Mark is, uh, I really enjoyed Mark's uh, plots he showed at the beginning about the growing popularity of Bayesian stats. And yeah, I completely agree that one of the main reasons behind that is, is um, the uptake of, of methods that we use to um, do applied, applied Bayesian stats in practice, particularly Markov chain Monte Carlo. And that's really what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, so I guess from my own reflections on teaching and um, some things I found over the years um, is that when I when I teach Bayesian stats, I think that sometimes there's a poor understanding of, of why um, we actually need um, to do MCMC. Um, more broadly, what does kind of sampling mean and how it helps you? Um, some people, I, I think because of the fact that we have access to pseudo random number generation from statistical software that we use, for example, in R or Python, people just think that you can just do sampling for any distribution trivially. <laughs> and so people don't understand that um, you have to have some methodology for doing so. And um, I think that the people don't understand what the difference is between sort of independent sampling and dependent sampling, which underpins MCMC. Um, also, uh, how some of the main methods of MCMC work, particularly the random walk metropolis algorithm, the oldest MCMC algorithm um, uh, developed in the 1950s. And then finally, I think that a kind of practical thing is people don't understand why uh, measuring convergence of MCMC is, is difficult, why it's necessary and how you do it. Um, I'm not going to cover all of these things today because there are too many things. Uh, I'm going to focus on just three of these, um, which is um, how I teach what sampling means and how it helps you. Um, the difference between independent and dependent sampling and how you can quantify that difference. And also um, why measuring convergence is hard and I suppose necessary and how um, we can do it. And uh, just to forewarn, uh, I'm a bit of a fan of an animation. And so throughout this talk, there's going to be lots of animations. Um, but before we get to those uh, animations, I guess I don't really need to reiterate this too much because Mark's already done my work for me. Um, but yeah, the reason we need MCMC is that if we go to Bayes' rule for inference, um, then we have this denominator term P of X, um, which typically to compute it, it, it involves either kind of a multidimensional integral and or sum that is just too hard to do in practice. Um, and instead, what we do is we try and summarize the posterior distribution by drawing samples from it. And the most predominant method used um, is Markov chain Monte Carlo for drawing those samples and popular software like Stan, as Mark mentioned, use MCMC to, to fit Bayesian models. But before we get to what MCMC is, we need to sort of understand, well, why does sampling from something help us to, to characterize it? So if we start off, I, I'm going to start off by, by discussing what is meant by independent sampling. So imagine that we've got a large urn that's filled with colored balls and we've got a number of colors and frequencies of each which are unknown. The question is, you know, how can we determine the underlying probability distribution of ball color? 
Well, it will come as no surprise to, to people on this call that one way in which you can do that even if you don't know the number of balls nor the frequencies of these, is you can just draw lots and lots of balls from the urn. And uh, if the urn is big enough, then uh, basically the, the samples that you draw end up being um, independent. And we see here that after I've drawn 100 samples from this distribution, that actually we're getting sort of some sort of convergence in the probability distribution here over the underlying um, distribution of ball color. So here, yeah, drawing one ball from the urn is the act of taking a single sample. And um, if you imagine the urn is, is kind of large and perhaps the balls are swishing around, then drawing samples from this urn uh, is, is doing independent sampling. And we've seen that it gives us a very efficient way of gaining insight into the probability dis distribution of ball color. The question is, can you also do this for continuous um, characteristics. So now imagine that we've got an urn filled with balls of different sizes. The distribution over those size of balls is, is unknown. Can we use the same method to characterize the underlying probability distribution? And of course, the answer is yes. If I draw enough balls from my urn, then, and if I draw a histogram of the underlying uh, frequencies of the balls with different sizes, then after I draw a sufficient number of balls from the urn, then I get some sort of convergence towards a probability distribution here. Probably haven't drawn quite enough balls. I, I know here computationally I was drawing from a normal distribution, but over time I eventually get some sort of convergence. So I'm understanding the distribution by sampling from it here. So what do we take from this? We take that independent sampling provides a, a, a very good way of characterizing a probability distribution. And it's, it's quite efficient. And by efficient, I mean, I need to draw relatively few samples from that distribution to be able to characterize its properties quite nicely. Now I'm gonna talk about what we actually do in practice. So generally, uh, and by practice, I mean in, in doing applied Bayesian inference, because generally when you do Bayesian inference, you can't actually draw independent samples from the posterior distribution. However, you can do something called dependent sampling. And, and dependent sampling just means that the next draw that we make depends on the current value. And Markov chain Monte Carlo is the most commonly used form of dependent sampling. So now I'm going to use an analogy um, to try and explain some similarities and some differences between independent sampling and dependent sampling that I've found useful when I've been teaching uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo. Um, and the example I'm going to give here is, is a dice, a, a single dice. I used to say a single die, but I actually worked out that you can say a single dice. That's fine. So now I just say a single dice, um, which is a bit confusing because I've got a picture of two dice here. But anyway... Uh, and a standard dice has got six faces, all of which are equally likely to be obtained on a given throw. And we can represent a standard dice, or here written die unhelpfully, um, by a kind of Markov state and transition diagram, where the width of the arrows between representing transitions between the different states are all uh, of the same width, indicating the same probability. I'm now going to introduce a die that has um, dependence in it. So we're going to introduce a, a, Marconi, a Markovian dice where we suppose that when I throw the dice, I can only go from uh, a given number to consecutive numbers. So from one, I can either go to two or I can go to six, each with probability a half. From two, I can go to three or, or, or to one, again, with equal probability a half. And we see that this dice um, has dependence in it, where the next value we obtain from throwing the dice depends on the current value. However, it has the same unconditional distribution, i.e. across all throws as the independent dice. So it's got the same mean. So we can represent a Markovian dice by this Markov um, transition diagram. And now this makes clear that I can only go between consecutive numbers. So the question is, which of these two dices, uh, dice is, is better um, and provides us with a more efficient way of estimating the mean of the distribution? Well, the answer is what we do is we just kind of throw the dice and we see how well we do. So on the left here, I've got my Markov transition diagram for my Markov die. 
And uh, I'm indicating by blue, dark blue, the, the, the current value of the dice. And on the right here, I'm going to show the running mean over time. And the orange line here represents the true mean of this distribution. And what we find here is that as I throw the dice more, uh, I get a running mean, a sample mean, which is getting closer and closer to the um, true underlying mean of the dice but it's taking quite a long time to get there. After 50 throws, we still see that we are quite a long way away from the true uh, underlying mean of this distribution. By contrast, when I go with the independent dice, then what we find here is that my current value of the dice jumps around a lot more efficiently. And so I get a much sort of quicker convergence towards the um, sampling uh, towards the population mean of this distribution. And so what we find here is that an independent dice provides a more efficient way of trying to characterize a distribution than a dependent um, th than the dependent case. And we can actually represent that relative inefficiency of dependent sampling by a concept which is known as effective sample size. Um, and so we basically quantify um, the effective sample size, uh, or we quantify the performance of a dependent sampling algorithm by this concept, which is called effective sample size, which is considering a given number of iterations of a dependent sampler, it is the equivalent number of samples from an independent sampler, which we regard as a kind of gold standard way of finding out about a distribution. And the quality of a dependent sampler depends on the level of dependence. Um, the more dependence we have, then the greater the gap there is between an independent sampler and a one that has dependence. And so what we find is in the calculations for, for calculating the effective sample size in MCMC is that as the level of dependence goes up, the effective sample size goes down. I'm now going to finish off by discussing um, MCMC convergence um, and as I said, I, I think this is a concept that has both theoretical and practical um, implications of understanding it. So I, I, I'll dwell on this a little bit. Um, but just to give you a little bit of a um, run in, uh, I'm going to start off by saying, you know, why, why do we actually need to model um, convergence of Markov chains? Um, and if we go back to the, the actual steps of the random walk metropolis algorithm, then what happens is that you start off with some sort of arbitrary starting position, um, which has been generated from some arbitrary proposal distribution, which by, by definition often isn't the, it usually isn't the posterior distribution. And then for a range of iterations, we then propose a new location using some sort of ju a jumping kernel. Here I'm using a symmetric jumping kernel. And then we either accept or reject a move based on the ratio of the proposed likelihood times the prior divided through by the current likelihood times the prior. And if that is above some, uh, some number u, which has been drawn from a uniform distribution between 0 and 1, then we accept that location. Otherwise, we remain where we were in the, in the next step. But why do we actually need to model convergence in the first place? Well, the point is that we start off with this initial proposal distribution, which isn't actually equal to the posterior distribution. And then we repeatedly take steps using this metropolis accept reject rule. And that gives us a sampling distribution as a function of time. And under quite a general set of assumptions, we're guaranteed that asymptotically the sampling distribution should converge to the posterior distribution. But in practice, we don't we can't wait an asymptotic amount of time. We only have a finite number of samples. And so I guess the question is, when practically can we assume that the sampling distribution generated by our sampling algorithm is a good approximation to our posterior distribution? And one answer to this is to monitor convergence of a single Markov chain to a stationary distribution. And we can uh, imagine doing this and we can ask the question, is there a problem in doing that? And to explain this, I'm going to use an analogy that I actually got from Bob Carpenter, um, as many of you will know, is, is one of the, the key kind of uh, members of the stand development team. Um, and in this sort of thought experiment, we're going to imagine that we've got a house of unknown shape and we've got an unlimited supply of bees, each equipped with a GPS tracker 
allowing us to accurately monitor the bees position. And the question is, can we use these, these bees and their, their positions over time to estimate the shape of a house? So what we can do is we can release one bee at say a random location in the house, and then we can monitor its path over time. And we stop or we collect the bee after its summary measures of its path stop changing over time. So we can actually do this. And so I've got my bee here and I'm gonna release it in, in the house. And what we find here is that uh, we leave our bee for a certain period of time and we think, oh, I, I've clearly left the bee for long enough now and that must be the shape of the house. But then I go and I talk to some sort of colleagues and they say, well, no, typically when I when I release my bee, I, I sort of leave it for longer than that. And so you go back and begrudgingly you let your bee go again from the same location and you think, well, that they're, they're probably talking nonsense. Oh, and then the bee goes into a completely new area of the house and you can clearly see that the shape of the house wasn't what you thought it was previously. And then you go and you speak to your colleagues again and again, they say, well, that still doesn't seem long enough that you've left your bee there. And so you sort of release your bee and you wait um, even longer. And uh, to your utter surprise, uh, eventually the bee goes into an entirely new area of the house. And so clearly the amount of time we'd waited previously wasn't sufficient to determine the outline of the house. So you can ask the question, well, what's the actual shape of the house? And uh, this is the actual shape of the house here that, that I sort of computationally generated. Uh, you'll see that the bee hops across between corridors here at certain points in time. That was a sort of imperfection in the way in which I've done this. But but yeah, you can see that I've concocted quite a weird kind of example here, but you can see the direct analogy between trying to work out the shape of this house and trying to explore a posterior distribution where you might have isolated modes or different parts of the distribution that are hard to um, access. So clearly monitoring convergence of, of, of you know, bees or your Markov chains um, if you use only a single B or a single Markov chain, it's very susceptible to the curse of hindsight. You can say, well, now we've definitely converged to the posterior, but we hadn't done a minute ago. And that's particularly the case because chains often get stuck in subregions of, of parameter space. So what's the solution to this? Well, what you can do is you can release lots of Bs at dispersed locations in parameter space. And effectively, you can stop recording when an individual B's path is indistinguishable from all others. So here I release my bees uh, at disparate locations in the house. And here, clearly, because the, the bees paths are largely non-overlapping with one another, I know I need to wait longer. And so if I wait uh, a lot longer, then what we find here is that um, the bees uh, paths all kind of overlap with one another. I probably still needed to let my bees go for longer such that all of the colors were homogenous here. But you get the idea is that releasing multiple bees or using multiple Markov chains um, from randomly dispersed locations or over dispersed locations in parameter space is generally a, a better idea. Um, but you can see from the way in which I've hopefully introduced this, that this is, again, not a foolproof idea. Um, you can still have areas of high probability mass that you're just going to miss from doing this. However, the more kind of chains you have, then um, the greater um, well, well, the lower the chance you have of actually missing something um, that's important. So, you know, all else being equal, I would say, you know, you could always have more chains um, if you, it, I suppose it's a bit of a trade-off between that and computational time. So in conclusion, um, from, from what I was just presenting on, um, sampling and more generally MCMC, I found in my experience to be fairly poorly understood. Uh, and it actually has a lot of practical implications um, because our main tools for doing applied Bayesian inference these days it revolve around MCMC. And knowing some of the details underneath those, I found to be critically important, particularly MCMC convergence. Um, and what I've found as well is that animations can certainly help with the story. Um, and so I'll, I'll sort of finish off um, just by thanking uh, Mark, Eleanor, Oh, I said I thank Mark twice here, um, um, which I think is probably about uh, about right in terms of the amount of effort going into uh, in, into organising this, from what I understand. Um, but yeah, uh, I'll finish off with that, and I'll leave you here with a kind of weird um, 
uh, sort of image or video that I generated um, for doing a random walk metropolis on the surface of a triceratops, which I, I had to do for my uh, <laughs> for my college here in Oxford, which uh, has a kind of focus on dinosaurs. And I thought, well, I, I do the intersection of, of dinosaurs and MCMC. Anyway, all right. Well, thanks everyone, and uh, yeah, I'll take any questions. Thanks very much, Ben. Those animations were really, really great. Um, so there are many questions in the uh, chat for you, and they are coming in thick and fast. So um, depending on whether you want to have a quick scan and choose some to answer yourself, which might be an easier option. Uh, or the, I can there is the, the um, just one uh, on on uh, so so the Q and A. Uh, were you referring to the Q and A, Eleanor, or the chat? The Q and A. Let's stick to oh, the yeah, Q and A. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, you should be able okay. to see them, Ben. Yeah, I'm just having a look through now. Uh, um, so, oh, go on. <laughs> no, no, no. Go, you, 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 you start us off, Eleanor. Sure. I so one of the questions is, um, do you have real world examples where a posterior distribution is not unimodal and simple like a normal, but complicated and therefore difficult to fully explore by MCMC, especially if you've only got one chain? Yeah, I mean, often in, so I work in an area of, of, of um, science, computational biology, and the models that we have there are often highly nonlinear, um, sort of differential equation-based models. And, and differential equation-based models are great. They've been highly successful across the sciences um, because you can express a lot of complexity in, in a relatively small model. Um, but that complexity is also a curse when it comes to doing sort of inverse um you know, thinking inversely about what parameters caused my data, because you can often have, particularly if you don't have that much data, um, you can have um, very disparate parameter sets causing the same data. And that's particularly the case if you've got a system that's got um, periodicities in it. So if you have lots of like cyclic behaviors in the data and you don't have that much data, then in theory, you sort of, your posterior can um, be quite, um, quite degenerate because you can have a given frequency or twice that frequency, say, also generating a data. So that's, you know, an example where we do find that for sure. Okay, thanks for that. Um, right, let me try and pick out uh, another question for you. So um, a question about thinning and whether you would specifically mentioned thinning and perhaps how you would go about that and to sort of motivation for it yeah it's a good question i am um, I'm, I'm not an expert in thinning i know a lot of people have thought quite carefully about the optimal ways in which one can thin um markov chains um i guess I, 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 my slight cynicism is I, i've i've always found the choice of thinning to be often a practical one, which is that I don't want to hold all of this data um, representing all of my posterior samples on my machine or on a cluster or whatever, just because I've got lots of parameters and often it's just a pragmatically set <laughs> um, to to, um, uh, to to minimize that that kind of footprint I've found. Because, I mean, ultimately, there's no real benefit to thinning because you lose information by thinning. <laughs> Um, it's just a case of, you know, um, you don't want to necessarily um, hold on to all of these posterior draws. So sorry, I don't really have anything that useful to say other than I've not found it to be a too difficult a choice for me, practically. Perhaps I'll end on a couple of uh, compliments that have that have come through. Um, one uh, is um, MCMC is misunderstood and uh, someone likes the animations and that we should be using more animations. And I completely agree with that to, to sort of demonstrate it. And another request for you um, is that you continue releasing videos for the Student's Guide to Bayesian Statistics book. And uh, the book and the videos are awesome. So there you go. <laughs> That's very kind. Um, yeah, I mean, it's actually... It's one of my sort of New Year's resolutions almost is to continue making lots of videos because, you know, I do research, but I continually think that perhaps the videos are as useful for people as as the research that I do. And so I am. Um, yeah, I'm in the moment I'm working on so an area that I did think about talking about today, but I thought perhaps not and um, was 
the area of Bayesian non-parametrics. Um, so specifically talking about Dirichlet processes and and lots of the other kind of exotic Bayesian processes that are now sort of starting to be used by the by the community a bit more. And that's something that I'm actively working on at the moment is trying to produce some material on that. So yeah, so I'm thinking about it for sure. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much, Ben.